Hi there, and welcome back to the Explaining History podcast. Thanks once again for tuning in. Um, we're going to talk today about the Reich Concordat of 1933, the uh, agreement soon to be broken between um, Hitler and the Roman Catholic Church. Um, I'm going to look a little bit about the kind of the the, the deeper uh, origins of the Concordat um, and the uh, chaos really in Hitler's government that leads to its rupture. And I think we can draw some really interesting stuff from that. Before we um, get started, just a few quick announcements. You can now find me on the Huffington Post. Look for me, Nick Shapley, on the Huffington Post, talking about history, teaching, psychology, and a, a bunch of other stuff. And as mentioned on the previous podcast, um, we're still hoping to uh, raise some uh, badly needed finances for the podcast hosting. So uh, if any kind souls out there can spare a donation, uh, if everyone spared a penny, literally a penny, every subscriber spared a penny, we wouldn't have to ask for uh, any help for the next five years. Um, So if anyone can um, give us any assistance, um, drop us a line at uh, nick underscore shapley at hotmail.com and um, hopefully uh, we can keep this podcast going uh, free of any corporate interferences. Okay, let's move swiftly on from that. So, in 1933, as part of the process of the consolidation of Hitler's power, uh, which begins in uh, January 1933 with Hitler's appointment as Reich Chancellor and takes a dramatic step forward uh, at the end of February with the suspicious Reichstag fire and the um, following anti-communist um, legislation and emergency powers uh, and the uh, the mass arrests of uh, communists, socialists, trade unionists and, uh, and fellow travellers. Hitler um, looks at the uh, Catholic Church with some degree of trepidation why? Well, he had uh, an, an admiration and a fear of Catholicism, perhaps overstated um, and, and in terms of its ideological power and the ability of the Roman Catholic Church to um, indoctrinate, in his view, um, its uh, adherents, its followers. Hitler, no stranger to hyperbole, uh, certainly overstated uh, the extent to which um, Catholicism had the power to indoctrinate. Um, the He was obviously uh, looking at Catholicism through the filter of his, his own ideological prejudices and, and experiences. However, Catholicism was certainly a kind of a militantly political force in 19th and uh, early 20th century Europe, um, and perhaps for the most of the 20th century was. You only need to look at the the politics of the Catholic Church regarding communism in, in Poland um, to, to see that uh, that, that is, is the case. Um, maybe it's only now in the in the 21st century that its uh, political power is is somewhat on the way, and this made Hitler extremely uncomfortable. Uh, the idea that there were forces in Germany that were uh, not loyal to him or to the, uh, an idea of Germanness, um, and uh, were instead loyal to to Rome, uh, to the the, the Nazis was uh, tantamount to a direct challenge. And also the ideologies put forward um, by um, uh, Catholicism or Christianity in general of um, mercy, of uh, tolerance, of turning the other cheek, of compassion, um, are, were directly at odds with uh, Hitler's racial ideologies, the idea of racial struggle, survival of the fittest, that um, uh, mercy was um, a weakness that uh, any race could ill afford, and uh, contrary to the laws of nature as Hitler saw them. So um, there were um, real um, fundament- fundamental differences there. And to give you a wider context, this was not the first time that Catholicism had been uh, viewed with fear and suspicion in Germany. 
um, fairly soon after the creation of a unified German nation state, the German Empire in 1871, the Chancellor Otto von Bismarck launched the, the Kulterkampf, the, uh, and his anti-Catholic policies, um, which marginalised um, a, a third of the population, uh, just for uh, just for the benefit of, of, of background, uh, since the Reformation, you've been looking at, uh, uh, within the Holy Roman Empire, which then becomes um, Germany after 1871, um, you're looking at something like about uh, a two-thirds split, uh, two-thirds uh, of the population were Protestant, a third Catholic, or roughly that kind of, of division. So um, Catholicism was seen, had been traditionally seen um Firstly by Bismarck, and then um, later by Hitler. Though there were also currents of this, undercurrents of this, within the Weimar Republic as well, as the enemy within. Um, why? Well, not only was there the connection with Rome, but also Germany, after 1918, is sandwiched by two um, aggrieved Catholic powers. On um, to the east is Poland and to the west is France. Um, the German Empire had incorporated uh, within it uh, Catholic minorities in East Prussia, large numbers of Poles who were still there at the end of, 19, after the end of World War I, um, and up till 1918, uh, between 1871 and 1918, in the west, uh, f uh, French or, or Franco-Germans in Alsace and Lorraine, um, which had, uh, again, a large number of Catholics. So there was this sense that um, there was a kind of a, uh, a threat to the nation's um, in national integrity and that Catholicism was synonymous with um, ethnic minorities. So there was fertile ground for um, anti-Catholicism, um, but Hitler didn't want initially to take the Catholic Church on. Far from it. Um, the 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 kind of the, the militant secularism within uh, Nazism, which viewed really the the only um, ideological um, hegemonic view worldview as that as being a racial one. Uh, meant that sooner or later something would be done about Christianity in uh, Germany, but Hitler had two had, had two differing objectives. Firstly, with the Catholic Church, um, Hitler saw, saw the Catholic Church as being uh, unified and obviously led from uh, from Rome, uh, and that was the the first main challenge. The Protestant churches, obviously since the Reformation, the whole point of Protestantism is it's not unified, it's not led by a, an, an equivalent pope. Um, the, the, you know, the Reformation was a, a rebellion against the ideas of popes in general. And so you had a, a smatterings of uh, small um, Lutheran and Calvinist churches uh, across Germany, they sometimes existed on their own, sometimes in other small federations and, and, and groupings. Hitler wanted to incorporate all the uh, Protestant churches together into one national Reich church that could then have be, be Nazified, um, that the uh, ideas of the Gospels could be gradually eroded, um, and uh, as, as happens, the, the, a, an Aryan chapter is introduced into the Bible. Um, now, this has major ructions which, uh, within um, the, the Protestant Church, and I don't want to go into them now because I want the focus of this podcast to be on Catholicism, but we will return to this in the future. Um, the, uh, but the, the um, plan of action with Catholicism was to first appease it, um, pacify it, neutralise it, and then eventually, probably after Hitler's war, had that war been successful, um, to abolish it altogether or to, to ban it from Germany. And something similar would have happened with the Protestant churches, uh, some kind of Nazified, um, uh, Nazified Gospels would have been introduced, and, and then gradually, uh, the, the, uh, in Hitler's view, though I, thought, I doubt this would have been possible, Christianity would have been swept away and, and a new sort of state cult of some description would have re replaced it where the where um, uh, official public morality would simply have been uh, racial ideas. 
Um, but that was a lot of it, as with so many things with Nazis, was wishful thinking. I mean, you only need to look at Hitler's plans for the new city of Germania um, to realise uh, how pie in the sky uh, much of the kind of projections into the future um, uh, Hitler had. So let's talk about the Concordat itself then, what happened. Well, it wasn't an entirely unattractive um, offer that um, uh, Hitler put to the uh, Catholic Church. There were things that the Catholic Church wanted from a, an agreement with the Nazis. Principally, the Catholic Church looked to Hitler as an anti-communist strongman. The uh, fear that the Catholic Church had was that um, the Soviet Union would sweep across Europe um, and with it, um, not only would the Catholic Church be de um, deprived of all its property and wealth, but a kind of a godless atheism would spread too. When you have uh, particularly a, lar a large Catholic Poland, very nervous about the Soviet Union, uh, on the borders, uh, on Russia's borders, uh, feeling um, uh, rather anxious during the 1930s. Um, the irony, of course, being that um, the threat to Poland from Germany is equal, if not even greater. The Nazis, fully aware of how loyal um, Catholic voters were to the Centre Party, they were the one of the main demographics that they could not uh, seem to sway in favour uh, of Nazism um, during between 1929 and 1932. Um, the Catholic voters voted in huge numbers uh, for the, um, the, the the Centre Party, obviously often directed by uh, Catholic priests and bishops uh, during Mass. The Centre Party itself had already um, dissolved uh, prior to the Concordat at the start of um, 19, uh, 1933, and it was the lay organisations that the Catholic Church was really seeking to protect. So these were Catholic trade unions, Catholic youth groups, Catholic social clubs and schools. It was these, the, the kind of the real infrastructure of Catholic life in Germany um, that was under threat. The uh, totalitarian nature of Nazism meant that uh, all institutions should eventually be Nazified and the idea that there would be um, rival youth groups to um, institutions like the Hitler Youth eventually caused uh, irreconcilable differences for the Concordat. So the offer of protection for lay organisations was uh, meant to be met in return by a promise by the Catholic um, community in Germany to abstain from all political action. Within weeks of the signing of the Concordat, um, the regime begins to seize property owned by lay institutions of the Catholic Church anyway, um, closing them down. And the, the question here really is, why does this happen? Hitler's gone to the time and the trouble to make this agreement with the um, Catholic Church, and then seems to be breaking it right away. We're not suggesting that Hitler is a man of principle here, or uh, above breaking agreements. That's certainly not the case. Everything we know about um, Hitler shows that his, his promises are really only ever kept when it suits him. But the question is, really, why does it suit Hitler to um, undo um, what he, the, the, the agreement he's made so soon. And I think the answer lies in an understanding of Hitler's government. If you look at who is driving these attacks on the Catholic Church, it is Himmler and Reinhard Heydrich, who are uh, anti-Catholic ideologues. Uh, Hitler is uh, fixated on the uh, perceived threat to Germany of the Jews, doesn't particularly care for the Catholic Church, and as previously mentioned, he's slightly in awe of its power. But he doesn't seem to have had the rabid anti-Catholicism that um, people like Himmler and Heydrich have. In addition to that, uh, on a lower tier, and we'll look at these guys in a moment, there are um, uh, Nazi figures such as the Hitler Youth leader Balder von Schirach, and the, and I use this term in inverted commas, Nazi intellectual um, uh, Alfred Rosenberg, who do various things to antagonise uh, 
uh, the Catholic Church. And the picture that emerges here seems to be one of chaos. Now, this fits in with what we already know about the Nazi regime, that you have a, a leader who is not particularly interested in the day-to-day -day administration of government, who has different lieutenants who are competing for power and influence, who are looking to push certain policy agendas ahead, even when they're contradictory to the overall thrust of government. So often um, Hitler isn't you know, steering the ship of state and making sure that policy is coherent. Um, he is allowing policy to emerge and develop in uh, what he views as a natural and organic way, but in, uh, what, in, in what appears to be quite a kind of a confusing and inexplicable and chaotic manner. One interesting detail is this, that on the 20th of July, newspapers were, um, were forbidden to call themselves Catholics, so there would have been all sorts of uh, Catholic newspapers, uh, local, regional and national across Germany, but they, they are uh, banned from calling themselves that and have to be called German. Well, the, the new Reich press laws would have stipulated this, and one, this suggests again that policies that are being introduced uh, don't have clauses and provisions within them to prevent them from contradicting one another. And so you get um, uh, internecine struggles between different government departments emerging and a, a, a chaos and a confusion as to what the official policy is. Does the Concordat mean that Catholic papers can do as they like? Or does the, do the Reich press laws mean that all newspapers have to um, be um, German, German and patriotic, uh, which policy comes forth. And it's normally Hitler's role to adjudicate in these matters. Um, Hitler sometimes does, but very often doesn't. And so a, a kind of a law of the jungle emerges. At this time, up until um, the end of 1933 at least, the Catholic Church uh, plays a safe political game and doesn't criticise the regime, even though non-Aryan Catholics are being uh, at least harassed, if not persecuted. And obviously the question of the Jews is completely ignored by the Catholic Church. Um, Cardinal Pacelli, who had been the papal nuncio to Germany and was now the Secretary of State, under Pope Pius XI, um, makes some uh, indication to the German Foreign Ministry that he might, that the Church might uh, make a protest, but nothing really occurs. It's it's not that leading Nazis were blind to the um, uh, power of the Catholic Church. Certainly not. Himmler um, has a varying kind of uh, policy of some points being cautious um, and making sure that no anti-Catholic measures happen without his say-so. Um, he didn't want a kind of anti-Catholic free-for-all. And then at certain times, um, putting churches under surveillance, um, ensuring that um, Catholic organisations had to apply for licences uh, from him personally, uh, and these sorts of measures. The um, real crisis comes in 1934 over the issue of youth groups. Balder von Schirach, who is a uh, on the fringes of um, Hitler's circle, um, a, a real a kind of also ran within Nazism, um, and a, a, a man of uh, considerably limited talent, Chirac decided that he would, uh, apparently independently of the rest of the regime, um, attack Catholic youth groups and encourage the Hitler youth to go picking fights with them. Um, he said it was uh, terrible that the, the Catholics, Catholic youth groups, the kind of Catholic Boy Scouts, um, existed independently of the Hitler youth. Um, and there, and often Catholic uh, uh, boys were 
intimidated into joining the Hitler Youth. There doesn't seem to be any central direction uh, from Hitler um, in this. It's, it looks as if it is um, initiative taken by a, a government minister himself. But again, that tells you something quite fundamental about Hitler, how Hitler's government was operating. Hitler was um, continuing to negotiate about the future of lay organisations at the same time that men like Chirac were attacking um, uh, Nazi youth groups. So one reading of that might be, well, actually, Hitler is involved in this and um, Hitler is actually directing these things. We'll probably never know because most of what Hitler did was informal and verbal, not written down and not signed. Um and this was a, a great way of putting pressure on the Catholic Church to do what Hitler wanted, which again is perhaps un unclear. There were a couple of assassinations of Catholic leaders during the Night of the Long Knives. Mainly the SA were assassinated, but a, a few conservative nationalists were uh, were, were bumped off, and uh, some uh, Catholic uh, uh, youth um, youth leaders were were murdered. Um, Heinrich Brüning, former Chancellor of Germany and um, Centre Party politician, was apparently on the hit list too, but he was out of the country at the time, uh, so we, we may never know. The final confrontation um, that tips the, uh, that really kind of tears the Concord out apart, is the inf intervention of Alfred Rosenberg. And Rosenberg, uh, in his um, rather hateful book, The Myth of the Twentieth Century, um, attacked uh, not only obviously the Jews but uh, Catholicism, um, claiming that it was some sort of terrible Jewish Jewish lie, um, and um, he wrote various other things about this. This is um, roundly rounded upon not only by the Catholic Church but also by the German Christians, who are fairly Nazified Protestant sect, um, and. Um, then these, this is not official Nazi Party doctrine. Uh, Rosenberg is is a leading Nazi, but um, his work, his his writings are considered to be his own. Um, so it, it's not it's it's not officially endorsed, but it's a big sign to the Catholic Church that this is what Nazis really think. By 1935, priests are uh, active in the uh, churches and uh, cathedrals of Germany denouncing Nazi doctrine uh, really as a result of Rosenberg, which again suggests that Hitler didn't really have a control over the messages that were coming out of his government. It seems to be an uh, unnecessary hassle introduced by Rosenberg, who was, again, sort of on, on the fringes of Hitler's circle. And as Rosenberg repeats his criticisms of the Catholic Church, you get more and more Catholics coming out onto the street for Catholic uh, events, Catholic May Day um, events and, and, and that, uh, and, and rituals. And as um, Catholic uh, priests uh, write in anger to Hitler and speak from the pulpit, leading Nazis say, well, look, they've broken their side of the agreement. Uh, the um, uh, Concordat is off. Now we can introduce uh, the state repression that we'd always wanted to. And from then on, there is, um, by 1936 37 there's, there's an upsurge in uh, state repression of, of the Catholic Church, with uh, churches being uh, shut down and um, the uh, priests being um, and falling under surveillance, sometimes even being um, arrested for periods of time. And the final um, nail in the coffin of the Concordat comes in 1937, when um, the uh, Pope um, sends to Germany a papal encyclical, a, 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 a statement from the Pope condemning Nazism, the papal encyclical uh, called With Burning Concern, or in German, Mit Brenne de Sorge, um, is um, printed and uh, at 12 different hidden printing presses and smuggled across Germany by altar boys, um, read out simultaneously on the same day by priests at mass, um, and it has a, 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 a powerful effect on Germany's Catholic congregations and it drives the regime wild. Gestapo men um, uh, who are... Um, 
infiltrating Catholic congregations report back this this outrage um, and the um, regime um, then uh, again increases its um, repression and surveillance of the Catholic Church um, and during between then and 1945 the fate of many Catholic bishops is a particularly bleak one though perhaps a, a story for another time. So as we can see um, much of the, the Concord that seems to have been uh, kind of a waste of time really. Um, the repressive policies that certain regime members were hoping to introduce uh, anyway become uh, you know be, become a sort of a de facto reality based on the the provocations of Nazi ministers and the response by the the Catholic Church which is to to be expected and I think if you're answering a question on this that the, the 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 reality of the Concordat is it actually shines a light on the nature the chaotic nature and the inconsistent and incoherent nature of Hitler's government Anyway, I hope you found that handy and useful, and I'll catch you on the next Explaining History podcast. Bye.